Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor to present Gerhard Lösch, the Austrian. Salmon here. Gerhard studied physics and mathematics at the University of Vienna. And since about 1980, uh, he's occupied intensively with pure tonality and mathematical foundation of harmonic theory, which resulted in the concept of a new keyboard, the sliding keyboard, which he's going to present in a video. Um, he was taken, uh, he was a participant from 1985 to 1991. He <laughs> millions of folks here in Salzburg. 2020, he occupied, has a new occupation with mathematical music theory and technical realization of this sliding keyboard. <coughs> so, this is. Gerhard Klosch, and he said he is going to just present his video and then he's ready for questions. The Sliding Keyboard, Part 2. Beim letzten Ecumenischen Symposium 2021. At the last Ecumenian Symposium in 2021, I presented a new microtonal musical instrument which allows unlimited pure intonation. There have always been keyboard instruments with pure intonation, i.e. with integer frequency ratios, but because of the limited number of keys per octave, only a small selection of pure tones was possible. For example, the Pythagorean tuning with the superposition of 12 pure fifths, 2 to 3, or the Kirnberger tuning with some pure thirds, 4 to 5. By dividing keys or by using several manuals, one could also capture more than 12 pure tones. Especially during the Renaissance, people were very inventive. Here an archi-chamber law. And here an archi organo demonstrated at the festival Wien Modern 2022. But the addition of more keys soon reached its limits. Already the pure third, four to five, causes difficulties because of the large number of possible combinations and even more if one also wants to add the natural sevens, four to seven. Professor Martin Vogel, who was also present at the Ekmelian Symposia 1985-91, to writes about this in detail in his books Die Lehre von den Tonbeziehungen, The Theory of Tonal Relations and Die Natursubtim, The Natural Sevens. So, there have always been pure tuning and pure tone instruments, but none could capture the infinite variety of pure tones, but always only a small part of it. When I speak of pure tuning, I am much more radical and really mean the unlimited variety of pure tones, which corresponds to the rational numbers as frequencies. This cannot be realized in a fixed keyboard, but only by the shiftability of down bars against each other. Its realization was not possible before it has become possible only with the help of an electronic sound generation. 
This universal pure tone instrument consists of several upper and lower tone bars that can be moved against each other and is called a sliding keyboard. I already introduced it in 2021 and there is also a YouTube video about it. The constituent element is the tone bar. It is based on the logarithmic scale of integers. Express in tone frequencies, this is the overtone series. Instead of numbers, simple symbols are used, which are formed as keys. The fundamental and its octave relatives as a square, the third as a triangle, the fifth as a circle, and the seventh as a drop-shaped symbol. These are the main tones corresponding to the frequency numbers 4, 5, 6 and 7. And their octave relatives such as 8, 10, 12, 14, etc. They are also designated by the letters O as an octave, T, T as in third, Q as in fifth, and S as in seventh. The tones in between with frequencies 9, 11, 13, and 15 are the secondary tones. They do not get their own symbol, but only dot-shaped keys. They are designated by the letters G, U, V, and H. Thus, we also have letter symbols that can be used for notation. You can also turn the tone bar upside down. Now all intervals go from top to bottom and correspond to the undertone series. On the frequency scale, this corresponds to the reciprocals of the frequencies, i.e. one quarter, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh etc. To distinguish them by color as well, it is shown in the opposite colors. So, so this is the undertone bar. The most important chord on the overtone bar is the major triad 4 to 5 to 6. So I call it the major bar. And on the undertone bar, the most important chord is the minor triad, one fourth, two one fifths, two one sixth. So I call it the minor bar. The intervals all go down now. So from O minus third, minus fifth, minus sevenths, minus G, minus U, minus V, minus H. Several major and minor bars, which can be moved against each other, form the sliding keyboard. I already talked about the combination of these bars in the previous video. Two bars are combined by sliding one key over the other, thus transferring the pitch. For example here, the root note of bar 2 is placed 
over the fifth of bar one so that these two notes are now equal. This can be noted by the shift code bar one fifth is transferred to bar two O plus the plus means that it is a major bar. If there were a minus here, then it would mean that the second bar is a minor bar. And that the note O of the minor bar is placed over the fifth of the first bar If there are several bars, the shift code is correspondingly longer. For example, here. The tones that have been transferred from one bar to the other are thereby the same on both bars. They are called support tones. For example, the and the. One can say in each case two tone bars support themselves on each other by having a tone in common. Often there are several tones. The adjustment of the bars is called tuning of the sliding keyboard. There are an unlimited number of tunings possible, especially since I usually work with eight bars, four major and four minor. And also their distribution is arbitrary. I prefer the one where minor and major always alternate. So this form. Since the sliding keyboard could not yet be built in this form, I use a reprogrammed LIN instrument as a replacement solution. It has eight rows of 25 keys each, which results in eight tone bars with a range of three octaves each. You can easily put a paper with key symbols over it. I can use the same symbols for the keys as before square, circle, and so on. Only they can no longer be arranged in logarithmic distances, but equidistant, because they have to adapt to the square key fields of the LIN instrument. This means, however, that the key position no longer corresponds exactly to the pitch, but only approximately. You can see this here, especially around O. The two notes, H and G, semitone and whole tone, are the same here, while they are different sizes on the real, the logarithmic scale. Here with eight sliding bars superimposed. Despite the disadvantage that the pitch does not correspond exactly to the key position, it is a fully valid substitute and I therefore call it the equidistant sliding keyboard 
as opposed to the logarithmic sliding keyboard. The process of tuning is completely the same as described above, except that you can no longer see the exact pitches directly on the key pattern. On the other hand, it may have the advantage of being easier to grasp. Despite the infinite variety of tunings, there are some particularly important ones that could be called standard tunings. I will present some of them here. First of all, the tuning classic, because it allows the playing of classical tonal music. It uses only O and Q as supporting notes, which are octaves and fifths, here and here and here. This results in major and minor triads, each shifted by a fifth from the other. So, tonic in major, minor, dominant in major, and minor, and subdominant in major and minor. The same shifts are made on the equidistant keyboard. However, it is recommended that you then copy them so that they are on one sheet and provide more stability. Now you only have to enter the shift code into the computer and it will calculate a protocol and at the same time output the frequency table for the LIN instrument, which is thus ready to play. I showed this process in more detail in the previous video. Now some examples for the tuning classic. One hears immediately in this simplest of all tunings, tonic in major and minor, the dominant in major and minor, and the subdominant in major and minor. Because of their simplicity, these harmonies have long since become ordinary. In pure tuning, one rediscovers their beauty. Some examples. Tone C. C major triad. the dominant, not only triads were used, so, but also no, sevens and ninth chords. Uh, in C, E, B, G, H, D, F, H. We also had the F, A on the subdominant chord. But you can clearly hear that the dominant F 
and A are different from the subdominant F and A. On the logarithmic scale, you can even see the difference. Here, G is from the dominant. Here is F from the subdominant. You can see the F of the dominant is lower than the F of the subdominant. And the A is higher. The two are not equal. Here, you can only hear it. That's why there are beats when you play them at the same time. In the lower register, even deeper you can also hear the beats become slower but the sevens can also be used in the subdominant or that long This is often used in the blues and therefore called blues note. Also an example with the minor bass. Minor dominant or major dominant. Now with sevens,
so you can play strictly tonal on the sliding keyboard. And it is also well suited as a teaching instrument for harmony. But even in the simplest, the classic tuning, it is also suitable for microtonal playing. Horizontally, if you stay on one bar, you have the consonant chords. If you add the secondary notes as well, and vertically, you have the close neighboring tones. And you can use those for micro melodies. But there are also approaches to a musical notation. If the tuning is defined, then each tone is strictly defined by the bar number and the key code. For example, this sequence of notes can be denoted like this. For T, for T, Three coup, 
5H7O If you want to translate it into traditional notation, it's a for other instruments, you have the note values with their send deviations on the tuning protocol. You can also transfer them to transparent paper and place over them. In our case, this resides in the notes A minus 14, F minus 2, A flat 14, and D4. But you can also play very wild on it. So far, I have only demonstrated one tuning, namely classic. For this, an instrument with fixed pitches would be sufficient, and the shiftability of the bass would not be necessary. Therefore, I want to show some other tunings here. Of this, I want to pick out the Pythagorean. Here you can see that 12 fifths superimposed on each other, which is the same as six whole tones, make about one octave. But not exactly. The axis is called a Pythagorean comma of about 24 cents, which is also responsible for the so-called wolf fifths. Again, you can put the note values over it. Another tuning would be oct 12, where you can go down 12 octaves. If one goes still further down, one comes already into the range of around one hertz where one can hear bar beats. In the symposia of 1987 and 89, I spoke about the essential equality of beat and tone and derived from this a new mathematical based harmony theory. Here 
here one hears interesting body rhythms instead of musical chords. Essentially, when each bar beat has its own pitch, interesting effects can be achieved by simply holding down several keys. But now, free improvisation together with pianist Sylvia Bruckner. Richard has uh, oh, one question. Richard has a question. Okay, it's a very simple question. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, it's fascinating. You must have to play very, very accurately because if you're slightly in the wrong place, then. You must have to play very accurately because if you're slightly in the wrong place, then. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Well, well, the instrument, the virtuous mm. instrument, but yeah. the work was uh, uh, testing mm -hmm. new. Uh, Jacob is based in New York and he's a musician, composer and educator and his music emphasizes in contemporary approach Jacob has performed on some of the most prestigious stages of the world, including Carnegie Hall, Arnold Fisher Hall, Jazz at Lincoln Center, and so forth. He has premiered new works such as Melvin Chamber Settings with New York Circle, Images on Harvard, and Pennsylvania, and Aquarium, and so forth. And uh, his music is available on WAW and Abla 
Art Records and has been played uh, on the New York radio. Jake regularly performs on tenor trombone, bass trombone, euphonium, and tuba. He's on faculty at Brass instructor at the United Nations International School. Welcome. Thank you. I am, as I've spoken to some of you about, I am kind of recovering from an illness I picked up in Japan, so I'm going to kind of limit my playing and aim my trombone away from everybody. Um, I am feeling much better, but yesterday I was coughing a little bit, so hence the mask and whatnot. Um, so this is my third time presenting for Ecmelic Music Society. Um, when I first came here four years ago, I presented uh, the beginning of my microtonal etudes based on quarter tone. Um, and those have progressed to the point where they're, they're finished, edited, and completed. Um, and then two years ago, I presented my, my complete just intonation um, version of the 12 tone scale, which I'll discuss a little bit as well. It's kind of a continuation of this process. And this year I'm continuing with the six-tone etudes, which I'm going to kind of discuss them in their rough draft forms. Um, I have six of them in rough draft form, so I have many more to go. Um, so, the first things I want to talk about are kind of things that Hans was talking about in his lecture earlier, um, mostly having to do with the difficulty of performing microtones um, on our instruments. Um, it's very important that we be able to hear what we're playing, unlike perhaps the quarter tone accordion where you can press the button and reliably get a quarter tone. Um, on the trombone, so much is happening with our embouchure, with our lips, that even if my slide is in precisely the right place, I might not uh, get the note that I want. Um, and just to demonstrate this and to maybe see where my intonation is today, um, I'll play in first position and just adjust with my embouchure. So you can hear I can, I can drop it an entire uh, half step down just by moving my embouchure, even if my slide is in the appropriate place. Um, so it's very important to be able to hear the, the intervals, and that's kind of the purpose of these etudes generally. Uh, another thing to consider when working with the trombone specifically is the instrument's not built. Um, quite the way you might expect. For example, like the fifth partial F in first position, if you play in the first position, which would be here, it's actually going to be about a six tone sharp. So you need to play it out here. Most trombones work that way, more or less, but it's going to be different depending on the instrument. And there are a few other uh, things to consider, such as we have seven positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, and it's not super noticeable maybe when I'm doing it there, but they actually are slightly further apart as you extend the instrument from each other. Um, so if you were to, you know, for example, put tape where you think the quarter tones would be on the slide, they wouldn't actually be equidistant from each other. So again, being able to hear the intervals is very important. Um, and the third issue, of course, that we all deal with is that we're very used to Western notation, we're very used to 12 video. Um, and hearing certain things in our ears. Uh, so, my next slide is very small, but this is kind of the information that I shared uh, two years ago on the online Zoom session, kind of discussing uh, how we can map, uh, in this case, 72 EDO to uh, just intonation intervals, and my particular theories on that, which I'm going to kind of skim over. Uh, those of you that heard me lecture on this two years ago might remember some of it. Um, so basically I went through many, many, many possible ratios that are near to uh, uh, the, sense, the sense that we would have for 72 EDO and chose based on uh, several factors their limit, keeping it in this case to 19 limits, which is the lowest I could keep and, and get roughly accurate intervals for all of these. Um, looking at having a, a combination of tonalities, utonal and otonal, uh, much like we do in just intonation based on a 12 EDO situation. Um, and then by calculating tenny height, 
um, which is a, a really great uh, calculation of relative consonants, at least in my mind, is, gives you a somewhat mathematically relevant idea of how consonant an interval is going to be in comparison to another, which becomes really important when you get to these uh, small intervals because there's many ratio options that are just very, very slightly different. So you can uh, have some kind of justification for choosing one over the other. Uh, the final column is uh, what I call normalized tenny height. This isn't something that I've seen a lot on the internet, but a lot of uh, or one issue that I have uh, when looking at tenny height is that the reciprocals or the uh, undertone ratios are always a value of one higher. Uh, the lower the tenny height value is, the more mathematically consonant it is. And so um, in the case of looking at undertones, uh, for example, the perfect fourth would be considered uh, considerably less consonant than the perfect fifth, um, which to my mind doesn't make the most sense. I think they're, they're rather close. And when you start looking at uh, even more of the microtonal intervals, I think it gives you a much better picture of the relative consonants between them. So again, that's a very, very quick overview of that, um, something I talked about two years ago, and it's going to relate to what I'm talking about moving forward with the etudes. Um, one of the reasons that I'm kind of glossing over this idea is because a lot of the deviations between um, equal temperament, uh, 36 EDO, and uh, just intonation are very small amounts, um, with the exception being like 13 over 12. Um, uh, a six tone larger than a half step is you know, a little more than five cents apart. Um, but the others are, are quite close, you know, uh, two cents away, sometimes three cents away, um, which can be a big deal in some contexts, but uh, for the purposes of training our ears to hear, I think most of us can agree if you have a performance where they're within two or three cents of a microtone or interval you best on the play, you're going to be pretty happy with that. Um, especially trombone, where your pitch might move around quite a bit um, because of the nature of the instrument. Uh, so, if you're uh, working on an equal-tempered mindset, you're going to be at least relatively well trained to adjust to any kind of just intonation ratio you might later want. Uh, so, as I said, four years ago, um, I began working on the quarter tone etudes. Um, now, the concept behind these etudes was that I was restricting uh, the interval content to um, an interval that you're familiar with, in this case the half step, and an interval that you're less familiar with, the quarter step, um, the closest, uh, closest 12 EDO interval that you would have for the uh, microtonal interval that you're trying to learn. Um, so this is the first one of the set of 12 for the quarter tone etudes. Right now I'm in, in the process of recording these with a really great uh, new music trombonist. His name is David Whitwell. He's been based in New York for a long time, although he recently moved to Amsterdam. Um, so we're kind of in the process of going through recording these. And this is one of his early recordings of the first one. And we'll just listen to, let's see if we can.
that, that uh, the only intervals present are the, the quarter tone and the half step and their uh, uh, reciprocal, their uh, the inversion. Um, the second uh, etude we've also begun recording. Um, we're still kind of experimenting with these. So for this one, he really liked the sound of the harmony for this one. Um, so in this case, we have the major second and the neutral. Good, so um, again, those were started four years ago, and I was able to kind of edit them and, and finish them during uh, COVID when I had plenty of free time. Um, but as I'm working on the six tone etudes, these are some things that I, I'm thinking about improving over them. Uh, the first is simpler melodies with a little bit more repetition. Um, I really enjoy uh, this set of etudes, but some of them are pretty difficult to play. And uh, for pedagogical reasons, focused on just hearing the intervals, uh, I want to focus you know, on a little bit simpler ones. Um, I'm also making most of them shorter because there's twice as many of them as the six times. So I need to write 24 as opposed to 12. Um, which, at least for uh, you know my first uh, set of these eight dudes, is kind of a goal of mine. Uh, the third is avoiding the inversions uh, because as I went along, I realized when I get to the 11th and 12th, I'm kind of repeating a lot of the ideas uh, that I had in the first and second, um, if I'm using a lot of inversions like I do in these ones. Uh, then less strict interval usage between phrases. Um, and those two, the only intervals present are the ones that we're talking about and their inversions. Um, but in the six tones, if it's between a phrase, uh, I'm allowing myself to use other, other intervals. Um, focusing on just uh, the specific phrases as the pedagogic um, aspect. Um, and then finally, uh, which is something I've been adding more recently, is the inclusion of scale exercises. Um, as I compose these, there's certain things I'm learning about the scales and different ways of constructing those scales that I think it's really valuable to include them along with the tool look at it. Um, good. So, uh, the first one I want to play a little bit for you is the second six-tone etude. There's nothing wrong with the first one, I just find the second one a little bit more interesting. Um, the first one sounds like very hyperchromatic, I guess you could say. Um, let's see, I don't have too much to say about this. This is the one-third tone, um, or the two-six tone. Um, I should probably, I'm just going to check my intonation, because this is pretty warm room. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I'd be able to play. 
<laughs> so uh, some of these we will listen to the MIDI because some of them I haven't had the time to practice. Anyway, um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the notation a little bit. Um, so I'm using the arrows, down arrows, to mean down sixth tone, and up arrow to mean up a sixth tone. And this is kind of my own system. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of other people use it, although there's lots of similar, you know, we've looked at like natural sign with an arrow up or sharp sign with an arrow up, etc. Um, this is just something that I like, and I just want to talk about some of the pros and cons of it. Uh, the first con is that you're kind of limited in enharmonic spelling. Um, you can do E flat up and D sharp up, that's fine, but then E double down is really, really awkward to write, and you end up with lots of space between the notes or other formatting issues. Um, however, uh, as I get into 12th tones, my 12th tone notation is uh, the plus and minus sign for plus 16 cents or minus 16 cents. And in that case, you do get a lot more uh, enharmonic spelling options. For example, you could mark E flat, six tone up as E quarter flat minus would be the same spelling. So um, if you had some harmonic reason you would want to do that, you have a few more options down the line. Um, the second comment is that it's not standardized. So you do have to explain to someone what, you're, what you mean when you do these arrow signs. Um, the next, uh, these are obviously approximations because six tones kind of have to be approximations. Uh, it should be, you know, 0.33 repeating infinitely. So we're, we're always approximating in some sense. And I think this, uh, this uh, way of notation kind of encourages approximations in some way. But the most important pro is that it's easy to read for musicians. Uh, this system is basically sight readable. Or at least I find it to be that way. You're pretty much just reading what you normally would and knowing, okay, this one's adjusted up or down. Um, and I find that to be a huge uh, benefit having read very many different microtonal uh, notations. So uh, when I was working on this one, one thing that I found really interesting and I kind of try to play around with in this piece, in this short etude, is um, the idea of like uh, perceived tonal equivalence, where you have C and C up and C down almost uh, sounding like the same note, um, which I think is really interesting. Uh, the sixth tone, I think it's really convincing. Quarter tone, I've similarly found convincing. And then the third tone is uh, not so convincing, which is kind of like the joke <coughs> at the end of this piece, is that you might expect the last note to be an octave, um, and it's not. And it said it's a third tone higher, so you really hear that as uh, it's an unexpectedly different note. Um, and I want to just try playing like the last four bars uh, three different ways, and maybe we can talk about whether you agree with me or not. So the first time I'll play it as written, the second time I'll play it with the final note being a C natural, and then the third time I'll play the final note as a C six tone down. Um, so the first time is as written. Yep. I think you are not coming out to the screen, so can you come to that? Is it okay? Can I do what? We are recording the lecture to upload on YouTube, but you are disappeared now. Oh, I'm not on the screen. Oh, yeah, I can do it. Am I? Yeah. Here? So, yes, most fair. Okay, good call. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is as it's written. Can you move a little bit the notes down because there's really any. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Very nice. laughs> Perfect. Oh. All right, thank you. Yes, also good call. Okay, so this is the last four bars as written first. <laughs> Composer and me really enjoys playing around with. 
And I think it's really accessible when you're using very simple melodies like this. You can really bring that out and hear these different things. We can discuss later, see whether you agree or not. Um, anyway, good. So uh, the exercises, um, I think, are a really important addition for these. And also just nice to think about uh, how these scales work. Um, you know, for the most part, scales that are using just one interval. And then in this case, this is the third tone scale exercise. Uh, I think I put a MIDI version of it. There's only two of these because it's a superset of the whole tone scale. Um, so there's only two there, which is nice. Still hear the microtone interval. 
After I finish the six tone etudes, I do want to do the twelve tone etudes. Fortunately, there's only twelve of them because um, a lot of the adjustments are, you know, at this point we covered the six tones and I've covered the quarter tones, so that's all that's left. Um, and that's going to be a special challenge because I'm going to have to really address just intonation more directly. Um, if I'm doing an etude where you're playing a major third versus a really adjust intonation major third or lowered by a twelfth tone, um, then I think there's going to have to be a more clear discussion on what you're playing. You're going to have to be uh, more conscientious about what you're playing. I think trombones especially are trained to hear just intonation, major thirds and minor thirds very keenly. When we're playing in an orchestra, especially, you know, second trombone, you're, you're playing the major third so often. So we really train to naturally hear that and make that adjustment. So in some ways, playing an equal temperament can be difficult. And I find myself, when I'm playing microtonally, I'm kind of automatically still playing in just intonation in a lot of contexts. Unless it's a very like serialized type of music, um, just intonation is going to come into play. So uh, as I work with the 12 tones, I think there's going to have to be a special, uh, some special discussion on that issue. Um, after that, I want to do a combination of the quarter, six, and 12 tone intervals and instead of more difficult etudes that are a little bit more fleshed out and longer. Um, that's kind of like the final course. Of, of the study, and then uh, move on with 5th, 10th, and 20th tones. My hope, by the time you get to 20th tones, you can kind of deal with anything else. Um, you know, at that point you're doing it with 5 cents away. So, uh, you know, there, obviously there are systems that are very precise, you know, within a couple of cents. Um, but I would hope by that point you would train yourself to, to adjust. Um, but I am also interested in doing etudes or exercises in Bull and Pierce. I've, I've written out some stuff in Bull and Pierce for my own reasons. Uh, when I was playing Christian Klinkenberg's uh, piece, The Glacier, in New York, there were some Bull and Pierce sections, and I worked, uh, you know, with some trombone-specific kind of exercises to help with that. But I think it'd be nice to explore those in etudes as well. 31 Edo, uh, basically other you know, more popular systems that might be good to explore and to train specifically for. Uh, that's it. Do you have any questions? <laughs>
play together and if it if it's aligns to a uh, to a pure fifth that is okay for um, uh, f for this purpose because uh, these uh, scales I see them as a framework so mm -hmm. we are in the framework and we are can we we have to be or in flexible pitch, pitch you are a bit flexible here and here and there but uh, you at the end uh, you uh, remain on, on this. Uh, like we do it in, in 12 and uh, that is the uh, way because uh, human uh, players uh, have uh, limited uh, cap yeah. uh, capability is in in pre precision that we have to accept and uh, and I, in case of Paul and Pierce maybe I could send you uh, I think I have the this violin uh, exercises maybe yeah yeah well, I, when I was writing I looked at some of your things and kind of based some of my I mean yeah, I, you, you know them I have said I, I looked at some of them I was some years ago but yeah yeah so yeah and that's I I'm not sure because I'm not a string player but mm -hmm. on brass our lips mm -hmm. actually they want to vibrate on certain frequencies more than others so yeah uh, it's it's very tricky and you have to kind of teach yourself to to not change things here and to only do it with the slide mm -hmm. and like i said there's other issues with that where you know if you're off by just mm -hmm. a little it can cause issues yeah Hi, okay. so, so just riffing off that so you have like a fretted embouchure in some ways, yeah. Like I, it's 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 very mysterious. I can't you know see what's going on uh -huh. here, but I can feel it. And uh, yeah. you know, like one one of the first exercises I started with in, in trombone, we call them lip slurs, where we're going through the partials and to just adjust them to microtones. <laughs> Getting your lips used to doing these kinds of exercises. Because they, like I said, they want to go to a certain place and you, you do have to kind of teach them. Like right. Now, my actual question was uh, uh, what parameters would you explore in order to make your etudes progressive? Yeah, I, well, there's, well, that's a tricky question. I mean, one of the things I'm working on with these is, like I said, kind of expanding uh, how the scales are used, whether it's uh, alternating intervals. You know, I'm only using two intervals, so often it's just the one that we're focused on, whether it's a seven six interval. It's just a series of seven six. Okay, this one is a series of seven six and six over six, so the, the whole tone is slightly larger than the whole tone. So you have to hear alternating between them. And then in the last one, it's okay, large, large, or so small, 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 large, large, small, 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 large, large. So mm -hmm. intellectually, you have to be kind of aware on a different level. It's not just a, a simple pattern, it's progressively getting more difficult. Um, that's kind of where I'm going with that. And also concepts like I did in the second A tune, the first of the six tones I showed, where it's using kind of auditory illusions where you're using the same motive, but now it's up a sixth tone. So mm -hmm. it sounds very close. Or like in the last one where I played bum, 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 where it's, you know, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just gradually moving up so you get that hyperchromatic feel. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what, I, what I'm moving towards as far as the progressive idea. So we have one more question left, and then we have to carry on. Uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, just uh, in in this kind of progress uh, of the etudes, uh, do you think that there is a limitation? Or would you be interested in adding a singing voice on the top of that? That is actually playing. Actually, you sing in the same um, intervals mm -hmm. that you chose, but different ones. Well, you know. Uh, well, I, yeah. I mean, that's definitely possible. Uh, there's kind of a whole other <coughs> set of issues with that. I mean. The, the famous piece is the Barrio Sequenzo, where you're really moving microtones. He writes those glissandos, but you're moving yeah. between the pitches, and you get beats between the notes. I haven't done a lot of microtonal singing outside of that, but uh, I haven't done so well. But we'll see if I can kind of get <laughs> it. In a combination, because I I worked a lot with trombone players, mm -hmm. and I I think that you are very very good at doing that because you have to hear and sing everything. But yeah, when yeah. you actually add a singing voice, mm -hmm. 
on the top of a microtonal plate passage, then it reaches a limitation. Yeah, you know? I, well, I don't know if limitation. Not it's, limitation, it's difficulty. It's definitely hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Like the, the sequenza is notoriously difficult because you do get beats between and it, it does things to your own machine. Um, but I think that's a great study. I mean, when I work on multiphonic pieces, I do a lot of like what I just did, where you glissandoing in and out of the pitch that you want. So you're here, okay, here's really the perfect fifth and all the things around it. And yeah, I remember my question very short. So you don't really use like a seventh pressure or eleventh pressure, but you always use slide and leave and sure to make that pitch. Yeah, I, we do. We use the seventh partial and we adjust the pitch there. So like um, in first position, we would have an A flat that's out of tune. So we don't play A flat in first but position. Then you play like a microphone music. And if I want like a pure seventh or something, yeah. you usually use the seventh partial or you just use the lead and sure and then slide. If it were up to me, like if somebody wanted, a, you know, a seventh partial A flat, instead of playing first position, I would just play a flat at third position. So we would normally play A flat in third because it's out of tune here. And the reason for that is because the, something about the metal and the way the instrument works, you're not actually going to get a perfectly in tune seventh partial in that position. So for the most part, if you really want it to be accurate, I'd rather play it somewhere where I can, oh, I'm a little out of tune, I can make an adjustment. Um, that's a good, yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we carry on with questions? <laughs> Um, Probably, or because it's time no? for the next. Yes. One more. Good question. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. 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 Which software do you use for your playback? Also a good question. Sibelius. I finally figured out how to make the the pitch shifts in Sibelius do whatever I wanted. It's not a precise system. This, these are all a little bit estimated, but uh, in Sibelius, yeah, you can do some pitch shifts and everything. For me, a little easier than Dorico. I just don't like learning new software. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Jake. You. Thank you. So, we're coming up with the next candidate. <laughs> Shall I make. Uh... So, Richard Wally. Did you pronounce it correctly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very good. He's a composer and pianist living in Manchester, but he's a senior lecturer. You are Bells. Didn't you say that? No, it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> it can be mine. It can be. I'll take it. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in composition at the University of Manchester. And his compositions are noted for their combination of timbral and textual exploration, their varied approach to musical line and formal innovation. He is particularly fascinated by the education of time and memory and finding musical analogies for shapes, processes, and textures found in nature. As a pianist, he regularly performs classical and contemporary music. So, well, let's see. He was a finalist in BBC Young Musician of the Year and Gaudianos and so forth. And his scores are published by Composers Edition and many of his works have been commercially recorded. Various recordings can be found on YouTube and more information can be found on his homepage. Mm -hmm. Welcome! Richard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the funny thing is that when you hear your bio read back, you always sort of think, oh, I wish I'd done a short one. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the welcome. Thank you for uh, sure. you know, all the organization. Um, I'm just having, it's fascinating actually. I love you being here. Let me just find mm -hmm. um, Maybe I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right, I don't need to say who I am because I've been introduced. So, um, but just to say that um, one of my main reasons, I've always been fascinated by microtones. Um, and in fact, 
in universities we're always sort of thinking about posing what we're trying to do as questions. And this question here, um, you know, how does one like Mike turn music for instrumentalist singers in a way that's immediately practical? I mean, this whole, all these discussions, so many presentations are about that because I'm finding it just really interesting the different ways of doing it. I mean, they've just kind of blown my mind that that degree of precision of tuning is possible because I always just thought that you can't really go there with non fretted instruments. But I guess I'm underestimating the possibilities of, 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 of training the ear. But I think, um, <clears throat> in my case, possibly as a pianist, frustration with the 12 equal tempered tones and just like, you know, just interest in other possibilities, that, that's just something that's, that's driven me. So if I'm writing something that's not for piano, then I always just want to get inside the other in intervals, because the, fun, the interesting thing, it's not just pitch, because we're talking a lot about pitch, but it's also timbre, because the, the, you know, the harmony sounds different, and that's, that, that's something that's really interesting to me. I don't think I've ever explored it in a particularly systematic way, but I think it's generally kind of intuitive and experiments around things. So what I was going to do today really is just mainly focus on introducing this piece, Lud's Church, which I wrote for Stephen Ortoff, who may well be known to some people here. I just wanted to give, I suppose, a bit of context before that. So there's um, just a very, really short excerpt of a couple of earlier compositions. This is 2006, this is a string quartet. Um, we have this wonderful privilege in Manchester being able to work with the Quatuor Donnell, which is just this amazing string quartet. And because they're so amazing, I wrote them this incredibly difficult piece that has um, four whole tone scales, a quarter tone apart. And it's, it sort of does it. And, you know, the challenge is to make things audible, and there's a sort of hierarchy, I guess, because the familiar scales are, 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 more, are more audible. Um, but this piece is really, really difficult, and in some ways, I'll just give you a little extract, but I think in some ways the difficulty of playing it, in timing as well as in pitching, sort of made me think, and also, I suppose, how easy is, this, is it to hear what's going on? It made me think again a little bit, but here's a little, you should hear a little excerpt of it. Oh, no you didn't. Why are you not hearing an excerpt? Is my sound up? Uh, okay, so why uh, is it the internet? You can't see this, but that little blue circle's going round. Uh, we have no internet. Is it? Ah, yes. Um, yeah. Ah. I, you can but try we... with my phone. It might work. But uh, this morning I was having problems. I might be able to connect to Edoram. Ah, yes. Because I'm... When it's uh, in your... Uh, yeah, hang on, let me computer. see if I can connect to Edoram. Yes. Oh, it says it's fine to connect. Let's connect. Maybe that will work. Sorry about this. Oh, I have to sign in. Is it working or? It's trying to. Oh, it says it's connected. It's the okay. okay. So let me, let me see okay. if that works. I don't want to talk too long because I want to have enough time to talk, ask lots of questions and stuff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just made that a really quick excerpt, so I'm not talking about this piece, but you can just you can hear a little bit about what's going on in there. Um, and this is a string quartet that's about 15 years since 2019, um, and Glissandi, uh, just really interesting Glissandi, and actually six tones. Just this sense that quarter tones are maybe a little dissonant, and I think six tones and third tones they sort of have a smoother maybe a bit smoother, I don't know, maybe less distant, maybe more resonance with just intervals. 
Anyway, so this is just a tiny little bit of this. Except of that. I felt like I'm controlling the harmony more. I was more satisfied with that because you can sort of hear the different things going against each other, and I like I, I like that. Um, anyway, um, that piece, by the way, it's called Mantle Plume, and it's depicting Iceland, uh, nature. Um, just I'm, I've always, and this is the thing about music, uh, nature. I've always gone into nature to sort of try and escape and just try and find what's in my head and um, think straight. And then, I don't know, the penny dropped. I'm going to nature to escape, to compose. Isn't there some connection? I mean, I'm looking at these beautiful plants and trees and shapes and outlines. Um, maybe there's something musical about that. So, so this is the other thing um, about, that I'm trying to do. You know, can music draw upon shapes, textures, processes, found within nature and have an impact on listeners akin to experiencing? nature um, and that's that's actually in Iceland but I took that picture and it was just the most wonderful trip I recommend I totally recommend going there but I also think Austria you is go quite beautiful. Uh, cross Iceland? No I, I booked on a uh, on a on a tour and they sort of on a hiking tour the Lago Vega trail which is one of the famous trails it's like a five-day trail yeah anyway um, let's go into this mode and um, yeah, so those are some of the things I'm trying to do. I actually thought that maybe I should call this talk Microtones and, and Nature, um, because maybe that's a bit more distinctive than what I came up with, but I thought of that after the thing. Right, so next part of the story. Um, so the pandemic happened, and um, at the time I was kind of working on a chamber opera, which I've sort of put to the side because it was just this sort of, it's a bit demoralising, isn't it, trying to work something on something big and you, never, you don't know if it's ever going to get performed or what the future's going to be. But when I was writing this, I found myself researching microtonal trumpets and I found myself on Steve Waltoff's YouTube channel, Microtonal Projects, and, um, you know, I, I got in, you have to get in touch to get information. I don't know, do any of you know Steve? Or yes, 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 yeah. yeah, very yeah. Okay, okay. so so and it was wonderful. Yeah, I wrote to them and said, I'm, "Look, I'm interested, and could you send me the stuff?" And then, quite soon afterwards, I got a message: "Would you be interested in writing a piece?" And this was great because um, microtones is just—it's like I've always wanted to go more in that area. And the thing about so he has a 19-tone trumpet, and he gave me the opportunity to write for his 19-tone trumpet, and. Um, now, I suppose one of the things we're talking about is the difficulty of dealing without frets. And in a way, you know, he's designed a trumpet that kind of does that. I'll explain very briefly what it does for those of you who are not, who are not familiar. But just the opportunity to go into 19 tones. Wow, this is just going to be fascinating. I've always wanted to do something like this. It's a nice little project. That, and if anything's going to get performed when things happen, it's going to be a solo piece. So, um, yeah. So anyway, the last place I went for a walk before everything was locked down and we weren't supposed to go far away from our homes is a place called Lud's Church. So this piece is called Lud's Church. These are some pictures of Lud's Church. The first three, I think, are probably in March 2020. And then there's one of Steve and I, when Steve came to visit. And um, when he comes to visit his mum, he flies to Manchester Airport and I live in Manchester. So, so I, I took him to Lud's Church so that he could see it for him for himself. And um, it's, um, it's a very strange place because it's in this woodland. It's quite high up. And um, so it's, it's all sort of mossy and lichen-y and sort of gnarled shapes and the trees are all quite small. And then there's this sudden chasm, which is very unusual. It's just like a crack in, in the ground. And you can sort of walk down into it. It's always muddy and dark and damp at the bottom. Um, and it turns out there's quite an interesting there's, there's history with it, you know, because people have known about it. So this is where it is. I don't know if you know the geography, but there's Manchester. It's kind of, you know, 
in this area called the Peak District, which isn't so far away. And you can see here it's you know it's quite hilly and it's in a little bit of forest. Um, and what else? Interesting facts about it. It was considered sacred by early pagans because the sun supposedly shines into the chasm at midday on the 21st of June. I really ought to go there. I keep forgetting to go at the right time to see if that's true. <laughs> um, but it was, it was used for secret worship by this group called the Lollards. And the Lollards had this reputation for sort of having these really, really long, mumbly hymns. And they were, it was during, oh, what was it? It was the, the um, Reformation. I think they, they were hiding because yeah, it was, I guess they were Catholic and the Protestants were taking over and, 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 and they would be persecuted for their religious beliefs. So, so they needed to go and go somewhere secret mm -hmm. to do it. So, so it's got that. It's also, it's Robin Hood. If you've heard of Robin Hood, you know, robbing the rich to, 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 to save the poor. There's, you know, there's ideas that it's involved in that. So there's just all this, it's a fascinating place. There's a sort of great depth for it. I hadn't realised that. I just thought, oh, well, this is great. And then you do a bit of research. There's all this stuff. So it's a right topic for uh, composition. So I always want to, when writing a piece, sort of try and capture something. You know, how am I going to capture Lud's Church into a piece? How am I going to make a piece that is definitely about Lud's Church, it's about nothing else? So I suppose the vision was partly to get something of the proportions into the piece. Partly, okay, 19 toes, this is fascinating. But I'd like to sort of think about the harmonic implications of 19 as well as just the melodic ones. So Steve said I could, I could do sort of multi-tracks or I could write, you know, tracks to be recorded and played in the background. So the idea of foreground and background, harmony and line. And I had to get something of the mumbling of the lullards in somehow. So there we go. Um, I'm sorry I'm not talking about microtones at the minute. I will get to microtones, but I feel like everything I say about microtones is slightly <laughs> intuitive and slightly um, naive, if you like. Um, I mean, I'm learning a lot from everybody. Um, but it's how you put it into context. I mean, that's what I'm really interested in. Um, so, I was trying to, okay, this is just a few sketches about trying to get the proportions. I, I often do this, and some of it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I drew a sort of little map of Love's Church on graph paper, sort of tracing from a map as well as I could. And there's these rocks, there's a crack here, which is castle rocks, and I just drew that. And then I, um, so what I had here, um, gosh, is I got some tracing paper and I placed it over this map. So on here, you see where there's a green line? When it's a green line, that's just like nothing. When it's black, it's over a chasm. And when it's pink, it's over crags. So if you look back to that, and then that. And I just drew the lines in the directions that seemed kind of interesting and made a nice shape on the paper. But it gives some kind of proportions. And I wanted to get some sense, the reason it's green and black, I wanted to get some sense. The thing about the chasm is, you, you know, everything is normal, and then suddenly it's completely different, and then it's normal again for a short time. So can I get that into the piece somehow? So um, the idea is, these are proportions for the trumpet part, these are proportions for the multi-tracks part, which is doing the same thing again. I try to put them, and I sort of measure them all out, and then I plot it into graph paper, and I come up with something that looks like a form, and then I work out at what the tempo is and how many beats each thing is going to be, and have some kind of map of the form. I'm going quickly because I just want to be able to play the piece at the end, so forgive me if I'm going too fast, but at least you can get, kind of get an idea of the thinking. Um, yeah. Okay, well, this is Steve, um, and I mean, his solution to playing 19 tones, I think, is, is really fascinating because it just seems so simple and so elegant. And basically what he's done is he's taken a B flat, um, a, a normal standard trumpet in B flat, where you'd have valves that lower by a twelfth of an octave, two twelfths of an octave, and three twelfths of an octave. And he's gone to a instrument, an instrument maker, and asked for valves that could be the right length to extend the tubing to lower it by two nineteenths of an octave, three nineteenths of an octave, and five nineteenths of an octave. 
And then there's also a sort of fourth valve sort of thing, which is similar to what you have on a microtonal trumpet, which can do one nineteenth. And um, you can hear, let's just play Steve. Here is one octave of 19. In designing the trumpet conversion kit, I chose the order of the valves quite carefully because I wanted to have fingerings that were close to standard trumpet fingerings and because I didn't want to have my trumpet structurally modified. In the end, I chose the following. Three nineteens for the first valve, two nineteens for the second valve, Five nineteenths for the third valve, one nineteenth for the fourth valve. Okay. So, and you know, this is a little bit of his fingering chart, but um, through combinations of two, sorry, two, three, five, and one. If you add all of those bits of tubing, you, 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 all of those valves are depressed, you can, get down, you, you can get down to 11 divisions of 19. So in much the same way as a 12 tet trumpet can lower by a tritone, this can go more than half of an octave, so it's more than enough to be able to do 19th divisions on, on all, all of the notes through various combinations. It's interesting. Um, this is a, I thought it was quite funny. You know, Steve calls it a 19 division trumpet. And you know, we often talk about 19 equal divisions of the octave or 19 tone equal temperament. He prefers just to call it 19 division because he thinks that, well, he can't really guarantee that all the divisions will be equal. Because the thing is, even if the valves do this, you know, there's still embouchure, isn't there? I mean, all the things that Jake was, was dealing with, there's, there's still logistics. Um, and the um, harmonic series is not in 19, it's, um, so, so there's, there's adjustments that have to be made. Um, but it does, at least, you know, that, that, that's how it works. I think it, it's, it, it's fascinating. And he's, he's created a lot of repertoire for 19 tone trumpet. He's worked with Donald Bastard a lot and commissioned various composers. And you can find a lot of information about what he's done online if, if you're not familiar with him. Um, I feel, okay, this is from Wikipedia, I feel really... <laughs> but I find this fascinating, even if this is like sort of basic for everybody here. But this is just all the sort of equal division scales. If you look up equal temperament on Wikipedia, you, you find it because it shows, it shows how they relate to various just intonation. And this shows some of the, some of the strengths and some of the attractions of, of, of it. You know, why, why 19 tones? You know, why is 19 proper? We've had 20, which is kind of weird. Today, and we've had 22, which um, has an appeal, but it's a, quite a different appeal. And, a, and so 19 and 31, these are the ones that um, maybe theorists have been most interested in over time. I, I think one of the qualities of the um, 19 tone is that the minus 6 here is exa almost exactly on 6 to 5. That's probably the best thing about 19. But the major the major third is um, actually the major third is <coughs> major third, sorry. the major third is fairly close <coughs> to, to five over four. So there, there's certain coincidences which which work quite well. And the other thing about nineteen, which I think is one of the reasons why it's been attractive to lots of people, is that when you go around the circle of fifths, if you go around nineteen times, um, then you get very very close to to, to an octave, but um, you have to go up 11 octaves to do that. So that, that's sort of like okay, how it works in 19 compared to 12. So, this, you know, one of the questions in my mind, why, why not 18? You know, like third tones, because third tones are great, but third, third tones, I guess, don't have this quality where if you go around a certain amount, you close the cycle. Um, so that, that's, 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 that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time listening, I don't know, just researching, listening. Um, there's an, 
a website where there's a sort of 19 tech keyboard and you can hear the intervals. And just thinking about the intervals. And one of the things that's so interesting about it, it's partly it's the relationships with, with just intonation. I mean, the fifths and fourths are not as good as 12 tet, but um, they're acceptable. Um, the thirds are really nice. There's something that's quite close to the um, seven to four uh, ratio. And but the, the um, semitones are weird because they're not semitones. There's small semitones which are just in a slightly narrower than a third tone, and then there's big semitones which are slightly narrower than two thirds tone. And um, then there's weird things like four nineteenths, um, which I find it quite weird because it's just it's, it's it's those are the things that sound most most different from I guess twelve divisions of the octave. I mean, I think that was why when you were doing like six over five, sorry, um, what were you doing? Seven sixths of a semi of a, of, of a tone, you know, that, that sounds really strange and interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, this is the melody. There's certain, it's, it's fairly intuitive, but there's certain things, there's certain intervals that I, I, I fixate and I try to restrict the number of intervals so that it's defined by those intervals, but I'm not being systematic about it. I've labelled some of them on this extract of the score. And you remember, um, like the sort of green line with the black in the middle and the green. So it seems like there's an idea here that comes out suddenly from what's been going on, so that the idea is that there's something that's suddenly coming out at, at that point within the structure. Um, so you have a line that I guess is quite, f almost like an improvisation, quite freely composed around intervals. And then there's, the accompaniment is sort of more systematic and it takes intervals from the line. And it sort of does these sort of rhythmic pulsations. So you see I've got a sort of kind of rhythmic template. There's an analogy, I guess, with what's happening in rhythm or what happens within pitch. I mean, spectral composers quite often talk about that. I wasn't trying to recreate ratios that we're using, but it's just the idea that when some things come at certain intervals of time, you can do that within notation quite precisely and quite interestingly and just get sort of patterns that seem a little bit more off kilter. And then I sort of map notes in the harmony onto that. Um, and the other thing is, this is the beginning of the score, I'll just show you that in a minute. Just about the, the Lollards. So I, I, you know, I was doing a bit of research, you know, what, what did they actually sing? Somebody had I don't know whether this is true or not, but somebody had found these hymns that they think they'd so which I wrote out. And I, I just, I'm sorry, I didn't really like them very much. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure what I could do with them. And I think it, it's just, it's too far from my style of composition. And so in the end, I, I took some words that they'd had and I kind of set them to music to get some idea of a contour. And then I used, um, well, I, I, first of all, I just set it in whole tones, you know, just so I can hear it all, all the same interval. And then you can see this is from the actual score, so it's mapped into three nineteenths, four nineteenths, two nineteenths, one nineteenth. So there's a sort of you can hear sort of different processes happening with it, which is kind of like a filter. Um, I think I'm just going to play you the piece at this point, and then and then I can answer any questions. Um, so. It's six minutes long. It's a great piece, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Forgive the advertising break. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get any money from this, so why are they playing advertising? <laughs> they pay more and more. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you very much for this uh, nice piece and uh, of course uh, 19 is uh, so somewhat quite also historically uh, researched and it has been claimed that um, uh, that uh, it is uh, in one hand it sounds very similar to uh, this uh, five limit system we are now about approximated by 12 equal but uh, on the other hand if you step away from that then it comes uh, very far from that uh, for instance I play in my lecture in one, in one of the first lessons I play the uh, fanfare from uh, Easy back, Blackwood, it starts like a uh, like an, uh, Baroque or Renaissance piece and, mm -hmm. uh, and then it drifts uh, mm -hmm. suddenly and that, <laughs> and, uh, that gives, gives uh, strange feelings or even yeah. I have a laugh on this piece, on this, mm -hmm. on, on, on this, uh, on this part and uh, goes away. And, uh, but in your piece I did the uh, didn't uh, have this uh, feeling so that it, 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 it was more like a like a like a system of itself. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that has to do with, um, I mean, you can play major and minor scales, and I mean, 19-tone 19, 19 jazz, you know, there's lots of potential yeah. there, because you know how in 12 tones, it, you know, it's mm. semitones and tones, so it's two, so it's mm. two, two, one, two, 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 one, mm. and within 19, it's three, three, two, three, 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 two, isn't it? Yeah. So, so there's these patterns okay. that you get, so you can, you can mimic tonality mm. within it quite, quite successfully. I mean, I'm, I, it, it's like, you know, do you write, I'm, I'm sort of writing in a kind of extended, not extended tonality, I mean, post-tonal kind of idiom. Mm. So it's trying to extend that same kind of idiom, okay. you know, where intervals are important and things. Mm -hmm. Move. I found something that was great about 19 is that you can take an idea and you just shift it sideways, by and when it's you know it goes up by a 19th rather than a 12th of an yeah. octave, and it's more subtle, and it's sort of it's quite different. You know, 12 seems kind of crude, and there's a sort of there's a, a tightness about 19 which I kind of like. Just that's exactly what Blackwood do in this piece, and then. Yeah. Richard, look, your new piece is already sitting over there. Do you see the pigeons? <laughs> <laughs> because you're interested in nature and lights. Yeah, yeah. Can you see them? Uh, Underneath the... I think I'm There's a little chop. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do see them. Oh, of course, yeah. I see them very much. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they like the piece, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they so do. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I think, uh, um, yes, we have. Uh, that was a really beautiful uh, piece and presentation. I had a question about how you were thinking about aligning the live part with the fixed media part, yeah. Yeah, and how you were thinking about. Uh, vertical harmonies that you're getting, was it something that is more kind of aleatoric or is it yeah. more specific? It's based off the, on the intervals, no? Yeah. The horizon. Yeah. In, in, in terms of how it lines up in time, yeah, that, that's, I, sh I, I can show you a little bit, hang on, let's go back to, I didn't really dwell on this in the presentation, mm -hmm. but. But it was great to hear the story, yeah. now it's oh, a different sense fantastic. about the piece. Sure. Can I stop it from Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so this, this is the score of the first. The, there's two multi track bits. So, sorry, there's two, there's, two, there's two tracks that were multi tracks. Each of the multi tracks gets ten, it's ten parts. And I guess he recorded this with a metronome in his ear or something because they're both. And he's, he's a superb player, he's so accurate. So it's all perfectly rhythmically accurate. Um, and so most of the time, this is in the same tempo. So I measured beats. So I knew, and I, 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 it doesn't really matter if it moves, if it gets a little bit ahead or a little bit behind of what's going on, because it's roughly in the right place. So whatever happens, you, you will hear the references between the background parts and the foreground part. And this is something. See, that first string quartet, I tried to control that, and so you get a lot of rhythmic complication and a lot of performer attention and just trying to play 
in time, which is fine, but um, sometimes it's not necessary to dictate that so much. So I thought it would actually give a little bit more freedom in the live performance for nuance and just like not having to be so tightly controlled so long as roughly it, it comes out. But Steve was quite nervous about playing with that, so he actually wanted to put more cues in. So you can see I've got quite careful cues in, in the, that he has, that you can see when he's playing. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, at the very beginning, you uh, professed to have a certain naivete. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the presentation, I'm hearing all this wonderful subtlety, you know, and... Uh, now I can't use naivete at the beginning of my presentation. I have to think of something much more extreme. I, I don't know what. It'll... Anyway, uh, thank you. No, thank Very you. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I'm here to learn, and it's really great to learn about people that have gone into a lot more detail. And mm -hmm. you know, some of the technical, some of the terminology, I'm slightly struggling with. But I mean, that's just a question of actually spending a bit of time just sure. getting my head around it. In, you know, in the university, the department where I work, then I suppose I'm the expert on microtones because because I've gone further down this road than other colleagues. So mm. for talking to, to students, then you know you can start at the at, at the beginning. But I, I, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? You open this book on microtones, oh my god, the floor just drops down, which is I guess why Jake has to do twentieth tones and um, <laughs> and um, thirty-one tones. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. But terminology and specifically. Were you referring to that, that you're getting your head around? Five limit, seven limit, thirteen limit. I need to look that up. Uh, what's oh, it? Yeah, well, what was that? What mean? Bowden, what was that? What was that tuning system? Bowden Pierce was it? Yeah. I need to look that up. Yeah. You know, it's a Johann Haas. Johann Friedrich Haas is yeah. a kind of a you know, freaky knowledge of all this stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I really, you know, I find this music really fascinating, actually. I mean, especially when it's a bit free, sometimes it gets a little bit sort of fixated. But yeah, I mean, sure. thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last, uh, very quick question. The uh, interval names and abbreviation, are they uh, you designed or did you found that from some... Oh, I don't think... No, I think I just got them from somebody on the web then. I don't... Mm. Is there standard terminology yeah. for them? Um, I can't remember what they were, were they? Oh, is that one mark? Oh. Mostly in Zen, I on like, uh, wiki, there you have... Yeah. Then Thanks. you have something often that, uh, for me, it's 22, it was theoretically, so I uh, I used some more practical names, and uh, mm. names what are uh, close to uh, uh, to GI, uh, in, uh, because then, uh, um, like, um, um, Septimal major third is uh, because it's uh, that close to nine had. over seven. Yeah, that right. that uh, yeah. I had no time to uh, focus on that in my presentation. But yeah. uh, because uh, if you have a mind that and want to see what the mm. image it, so that just a pedagogical approach. Mm. Oh yeah, I think these is, are quite simple, aren't they? Really? Mm. I think they are. These are these uh, theoretical names. What they are. Yeah, but I don't take credit for those. I got them from somewhere on the yeah. internet. Yeah. I thought it was from Joseph Mon uh, Monson, but then he doesn't use TET anymore. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make just two uh, observations. Uh, Steve was here with yeah. uh, uh, Donald. They were here twice. Then uh, Steve had a presentation with uh, an ensemble. I can't remember the name. I'm very bad for names. Awesome. Um, yes. Ah, uh, there were three musicians oh, for okay. percussion. I can't remember, but it's on the book. They say Steve published an interview on the last book, and um, yeah, so he's very familiar with us. And then uh, I think um, I I'm not very precise with dates and names, but uh, yeah, there are enough people here to correct me. But I think the first person to use EDO because he used to be T-E-T. -E mm -hmm. Frank and yeah. Hans, they know much better than me, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think Joseph Monsoon was the first one who proposed EDO, like, almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think most people, I mean, I also use EDO. I yeah. didn't know why. 
Nice. And then I met him in January in yeah. uh, uh, Pernu in the festival that yeah. Hans uh, uh, directs, mm -hmm. and he told me, and I okay, it's really great to know. And mm -hmm. he has this uh, encyclopedia, very useful. You can find everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, Tonarts of encyclopedia. Yes. Yeah. Uh, ideal uh, is to prefer because uh, uh, tone equal temperament automatically implies that the octave is the same for the period, uh, but uh, at least if it, if it comes to uh, a bowl and pierce uh, what is a, has, a, has another period, mm -hmm. so then, uh, then you, in your abbreviation or in the terminology you include the possibility to change the uh, period, and, uh, and that is uh, that is that why most uh, nowadays microtonalists would prefer uh, EDO instead of T E T. Yeah, fair enough. I can mm. I just I mean what what is the tone when you don't have twelve anyway? So yeah. I, I, yeah. So, but, but then it would be like equal divisions of a of a twelve. Yeah. EDO is like a, you are equally dividing octave. But yes. there could be other approaches than just equally dividing the octave. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So but uh, as people for say that the uh, temper tom, temper the fifth means diminish the fifth because you have to uh, to take the Pythagorean comma and to diminish mm -hmm. the fifth to to tune uh, in the temper well temperament. Uh, so if you if you go to with uh, n tone thirteen fourteen you have not to temper so uh, TET is not appropriate. So this is uh, the main mm -hmm. reason, I think. Yes, yes. Fair enough. I will. I will use EDO in future and <laughs> still profess to naivety in case like, there's a sort of so audience. It's, yeah. It's also usual to, to, to speak about the problem. Yeah. And then the O uh, the can. Uh, if necessary, the O we can replace this T for the theta for the uh, twelfth uh, in, in Poland Pierce they name it also three half, or you can replace whatever you want to uh, divide your preferred equal and then you divide uh, equally uh, seven over four. Then you can uh, say uh, I make a scale what is uh, maybe fifteen uh, uh, 15, 15 uh, ED 7 over 4. So sure, yeah. And I suppose it's, it's, it's enormously flexible, mm. this abbreviation. <laughs> and it's presumably best to deal with um, ratios because yeah. if you use you know, an octave and a fifth, mm. 3 over 2, it's, mm. it doesn't work. An octave and a fifth refers to an octave, doesn't it? So, yeah. Okay, yes, good idea. Thank you very much.